Hey there, RP Plus, RPU, welcome back. Dr. James Hoffman here as always. And today we're gonna to be looking at our third video in our movement anatomy series. And this one's gonna be relatively easy going. So today our goal is to talk a little bit more about the elbow and the wrist and hand. So something that's not as nearly as complicated as we've already talked about in the shoulder, but still there are some noteworthy structures, muscles, and actions that we should discuss. So let's go ahead and get started. So no surprise based on what I've already told you, today we're gonna to talk about the elbow the wrist and hand, and then I'll give you some examples just like I did last time. So let's start with the elbow, nice and easy. So the elbow is actually a conglomerate of three bones that we're generally gonna be talking about. The first is the humerus, which is that big meaty arm bone up top here. The radius, which is a smaller bone in the forearm on the thumb side, and the ulna, which is another small forearm bone on the pinky finger side. So essentially, when we're looking at the elbow, we're looking at the interaction of those three bones and how they move around. So the elbow is actually not just kind of a single joint like we usually think of as just this kind of like, okay, here's the joint, this is the axis. It's actually three joints in one. We're actually looking at the way that the humerus interacts with the ulna, so the humeral ulna. We're also looking at how the humerus interacts with the radius, so the humeral radial joint. And we're also looking at how the radius interacts with the ulna, or sometimes called the radial ulnar joint. So we actually have three kind of joints that we're working with. Now for our purposes, for our SES majors and future students, we're really just gonna be looking at about, you know, the gross movement of the elbow. We're not gonna be as concerned about really, really finite movements, and that's gonna be the majority of our discussion today. So let's keep going. So when we're talking about movements at the elbow, there's a few primary ones. Not like the shoulder where we had a whole bunch of wacky ones, right? So when we're talking about the elbow, we're primarily talking about sagittal plane movement, which will be flexion and extension. So for flexion, that is when the forearm, or my hand, essentially is moving towards the shoulders, and I'm closing the angle between my humerus and the radius and ulna portion of my arms, right? So for flexion, what we're seeing is the hand comes towards the shoulder, and the joint angle is getting smaller. So if I hold my hand out straight, the joint angle is getting smaller during flexion. During extension, it's quite the opposite, right? So I'm starting with my hand closer to my shoulder up here, and I will be extending my arm out and opening up this joint angle till my arm is fully straight, right? So with extension, the forearm moves away from the shoulder and the joint angle of the elbow increases. We can also see some kind of unique movements here. We're gonna see some pronation and supination. So pronation is an internal rotation of the forearm, right? So of the radius and the ulna, where we're gonna result in a palms down finished posture here. So for pronation, what I'm gonna do is I can start neutral or I can start with my palms up. And when I'm pronating, I'm essentially moving towards a palms down position. On the other side, we have supination, which is kind of the opposite. So we're gonna see external rotation of the forearm and that's gonna result in the radius and ulna turning over and resulting in a palms up position. So the stupid way that I think everyone learns in anatomy and physiology, and it's the way that I still think about it, if you get these two confused, supination is like making a bowl of soup with your hands. Supination, think bowl of soup. Really stupid, I know, but that's a really easy way to remember it. So pronation, palms down, supination, palms up. Those are gonna be the primary movements that we're gonna be talking about in the elbow. Now, these are very cut and dry, very kind of vector linear movements. We have to keep in mind that real life movement is usually a combination of multiple movements, right? So if you're thinking about like throwing a baseball or a shot put or a football or something like that, we're gonna see a combination of these movements. It's not gonna be something that we can just purely describe as flexion extension or pronation supination kind of stuff. Makes sense? But this gives us a really good basis to start off of. So let's keep going. Okay. Here's our handy table. So we talked about this last time. I just wanna remind you, here we have the table that explains some of the major muscles and the origin insertions of those muscles and the actions of those muscles. Now for the elbow, we have a lot of different muscles that can act on the elbow. So here are kind of the ones that are worth noting. So the first one, most obvious one that most of us hopefully are familiar with are the biceps brachii, right? It's that big meaty portion, the one that you make a muscle and you flex, right? Trying to show off for the ladies, beach season, all that stuff. This is going to be one of our primary elbow flexors, and it also helps in supination. One other weird thing that we can see with the biceps brachii is it does provide some weak shoulder flexion, so your ability to raise your arm up like so, right? So it does assist a little bit in that. And you can see, again, the origins and insertions here listed. Now, I'm going to remind you, because it's important, is memorizing the origins and insertions of all these muscles worth your time? Probably not. Will it make you a better sport and exercise scientist? Absolutely. However, 
this information is readily available to you at any given time. So if you ever forget what the origin and insertion of a given muscle group is, you can look it up in an anatomy and physiology textbook or on Wikipedia, it's all there for you. So what I would say is if you're not a um, like physical therapist, athletic trainer, or you don't wanna be a, a medical doctor, orthopedic surgeon or something like that, those are careers where memorizing this stuff is actually worth your time. If you are a sport and exercise science person, like a strength coach, personal trainer, fitness enthusiast, is it worth your while? It, it would make you a better student, certainly, but it's gonna require a lot of mental resources to memorize all this stuff. And again, that's why I have made a table for you just so you can reference later on. So if you know all the landmarks and you can do a little vector analysis, it really helps you understand how the muscles move. However, this information is again readily available, so we have summarized it for you here. So anyways, back to business. So the biceps brachii are gonna be one of our primary elbow flexors. It's gonna help us do some supination and it's also gonna help flex the shoulder a little bit. Brachialis is another one that's gonna help us and that's just gonna be almost exclusively for elbow flexion. And we're gonna have some pictures of some of these up here in a minute. We have the brachioradialis, which is gonna be involved again in elbow flexion and supination. And then on the opposite side of the body, on the posterior side, we have the triceps brachii. So biceps, two heads, triceps, three heads, right? So the triceps is gonna be kind of the polar opposite on this one. And this one, we're gonna actually see some weak shoulder extension. So our ability to go kind of past the midline of the body with the shoulder, but it's gonna be one of our primary elbow extensors, right? So essentially we have the biceps are gonna be the main flexors, and then the triceps are going to be the main extensors. So those two muscle groups are what we call antagonistic, meaning they oppose each other in their action. Make sense so far? Hopefully nothing too crazy. So we got some pictures and stuff coming up. A Couple more what we have to touch on. Next, we have the supinator. If you get this wrong on an exam, I will personally find you and punch you in the head. Why? Well, what do you think the action of the supinator is? Supination, right? So don't get that one wrong on a quiz or on an exam when you're in school because I will find you, I will find you. Right, so what does supinator do? Really easy, it does supination. Again, so that's moving towards a palms up position. We have a couple other that are noteworthy, the pronator quadratus, which is gonna be involved in pronation, so that's the opposite, so it's gonna be antagonistic to the supinator, right? So we have supination, pronation. And then we have the pronator teres, as the name implies, pronation, pronator teres, pronation, which is gonna help in both pronation and elbow flexion. So some of these are kind of obvious, right? So if you see supinator, supination, if you see pronator quadratus or pronator teres, it implies pronation. So those ones are kind of no-brainers, hopefully. So let's take a look at the next slide, and we can see some pictures of all these different muscle groups. Now, again, you can look this up on Wikipedia, or you can do a Google image search, or you can um, find a textbook with all this stuff. What I would encourage you to do, at least for personal practice, especially with these really easy ones like the biceps, look at the origins and insertions, note them, and then think about the line of pull, right? We know that the muscle can only shorten, it can't forcibly extend, it can only forcibly shorten, and this will really help you understand how these muscles work, right? So if you know where it starts and where it finishes and the only way that it can move, you have a pretty good idea of what muscle action that will be. So it's a good kind of thought experiment for yourself as you're going forward and learning all this stuff on your own. So in the meantime, we just want you to be familiar with the terms and understand what they do. Um, go, and that's, this will be kind of like your homework from this point on. Do that little mini vector analysis, find all those landmarks, see what they look like, and then see if you can imagine making a vector of that muscle actually contracting. Really, really useful. Something I used to do when I was in school and it really helped me out a lot. Okay. So that's the elbow, not too bad. Most of those muscles we're pretty familiar with and most of the actions are pretty self-explanatory. The wrist and hand is a little bit more complicated. We know that the wrist and hand are composed of a whole bunch of different muscles and a whole bunch of different bones. Some of them are more and less noteworthy than others. So when we're talking about what actions we can expect to see at the wrist and hand, we're gonna prim primarily see what's on this list here. So first we're gonna see kind of wrist flexion extension, right? So for wrist flexion, we're gonna see the palm and or the fingers moving towards the anterior forearm. So essentially I'm trying to bring my fingers close to my forearm, that will be flexion. Extension is gonna be the opposite. My palm and fingers will move towards the posterior side of my forearm. So I'll be kind of doing a wrist up type position. So the back of my hand trying to touch my forearm, that will be extension. We can see what's called radial deviation, which is essentially kind of like an abduction type movement where we're trying to move the hand in the direction towards the thumb. So I'm trying to close the distance between my thumb and my forearm. That is radial deviation. 
On the opposite side, we have ulnar deviation, where I'm trying to move my pinky finger towards my forearm. So I'm trying to close the gap between my pinky and my forearm. That's ulnar deviation. And then of course we have things like finger flexion, where I'm actually causing my fingers to close, and I have finger extension, where I'm forcibly opening up my fingers, right? So hopefully these are things that we're pretty familiar with, or at least uh, from a day-to-day -day basis, we kind of know kind of intuitively, like, oh yeah, I have to close my fingers, I have to open my fingers, I have to move my wrist a certain way, right? Nothing too surprising there. So those are gonna be the major actions that we're gonna talk about. The wrist and hand are made up of a number of different bones. So we can see on this slide, right, we have eight carpal bones that make up the wrist and they're kind of small, very uh, cube or irregular shaped uh, bones. We have five metacarpals, which are these kind of medial, in, uh, medium sized intermediary bones that go between the wrist and they go up into the hand. And then last we have about 14 phalanges, which is kind of the upper portion of your fingertips and fingers here. So the carpals are the bones in your wrist, the metacarpals are kind of like the big bones in your hands, and then the phalanges are kind of the smaller joint bones in your fingers. Make sense? Now, there's a correct number and sequence of these things, but for our purposes, again, if you're not like going into AT or PT, OT, any of those kind of things, not a huge deal. Just be aware that they exist, right? So if we look at the wrist bones a little bit more, we can see all of these more specifically. Now, I remember there's a number of different mnemonic devices you can use to memorize the name of all of these bones. Again, it's one of those things, is it useful for you as an SES person? Maybe for me, and this is just my personal opinion, you can take it or leave it, uh, it requires a lot of mental resources to keep this kind of information in the tank for me. So for me, this was something that I realized I can look up very easily. It's kind of like when, uh, you're looking at physics equations, like kinematic equations, like figuring out displacements and velocities and time frames, right? Does it help you to know calculus? Yeah, if you know calculus, you can derive all those equations and it makes perfect sense, right? Do you need to know calculus? No, because you can look it up in a textbook or something somewhere else, right? So it's not a huge deal. So it's one of those things, like how much mental resource do you want to allocate to that? I would say probably not a lot since it's information that's readily available to you, okay? So anyways, those are the bones of the wrists. It is noteworthy if you are gonna go into athletic training because this is a common site of injury for a lot of sports. Now, we know that the movement of the hand is going to be through coordinated efforts of both intrinsic muscles of the hand and extrinsic muscles that affect the hand, which is kind of a weird way to think about it. So what we know is there are a little bit of intrinsic muscles in the hands and they can actually do some nice specific finite movements, but most of the movement that we're gonna see in the hand and primarily in the wrist as well is gonna be through extrinsic muscles. So when we're talking about intrinsic, that means inside the hand, Extrinsic muscles are gonna be muscles that are housed in the forearm, which will be affecting the hand and the fingers, right? So primarily we're gonna be looking at our extrinsic muscles. Now, what we're trying to uh, just make a point here of saying, are there muscles that are also inside the hand that we should know about? For sure, but for the most part, their actions are not gonna be as important as the ones that we're gonna talk about today, which are in the extrinsic portion. And this is not an all-inclusive list by any means. It's just meant to kind of get you introduced to some of these topics. So for the most part, the most important muscles that are gonna be acting on the hand and in the fingers are gonna be in our extrinsic group, and we can kind of break that down into two subgroups. The first one is kind of what I like to call the medial epicondylar groups, which are those that originate on the medial epicondyle, and the lateral epicondylar group, which are those that generally originate on the lateral epicondyle. What I want you to find first is the olecranon, which is this pointy part of the elbow. It's what most of us call the funny bone kind of area, right? That big pointy bulging part out. So once we find that, there's two bony landmarks that we wanna find right after that. So what I would say is flex your arm to about 90 degrees, right? So about 90 degrees, make a muscle. And then once you found the olecranon, just go outside of that to the left and to the right and feel around a little bit. What you'll find is there's two big bumps on the inside and on the outside of your elbow. Those are the medial and lateral epicondyles, and that's where a lot of these muscles are gonna be originating from. So the one on the inside facing the body, right? That's the medial one. And then the one on the outside, got to feel around for it, is the lateral epicondyle. So the reason why we've done this is we've kind of categorized them into these two groups because they share a common origin. Excuse me, maybe not necessarily a common insertion, but because their origin is the same, a lot of the muscle actions are very, very similar. So let's take a look at these two groups, huh? So the first one is our medial group. And we have a whole number of different muscles, right? And 
The forearm, if you've never studied it before, is complicated. There's a number of different layers and the muscles very often you cannot see underneath until you peel off layers of muscle. So what we find with the forearm is that there's lots and lots of kind of swirling layers of muscles in there. So it can be really, really hard to study and they all kind of look very similar, especially if you've ever looked at a cadaver, which is basically like beef jerky. So it can be very, very difficult to identify um, but what we find is that they all have a lot in common. So let's take a look on here, right? So first off, you see the first four all originate on the medial epicondyle, and then they have somewhat unique insertion points. The flexor carpi radialis is gonna be involved in wrist flexion and radial deviation. Palmaris longus is gonna be just involved in wrist flexion. Flexi car carpi ulnaris, wrist flexion and ulnar deviation. And then flexor digitorum superficialis, so flexor digitorum, like flex your digits, superficialis, superficial is going to be involved in finger and wrist flexion, right? So that's kind of an easy one. So a lot of the ones that say flexor, you should think flexion, right? And like flexor digitorum, uh, digits, fingers, really, really easy way to think about that. Now we also have down there, you see plus one, flexor digitorum profundus. This one's kind of grouped into this category as well, although it does not share that same common origin point. But we clump it in there because it's very, very similar and has very, very similar actions. So we see flexor digitorum profundus is involved in finger and wrist flexion. So all of these generally are gonna be in our wrist or finger flexion kind of movement groups. And then some of them might be involved in radial or ulnar deviation, right? If we look at the uh, picture here, we have a nice kind of easy way of graphical way of looking at it. So this is something that we used to do when I was in like our sports injury management class, we would use our forearm and our hand as an example of like where you can identify some of these. And then on the right, we see another picture and you can see here, like on a much bigger scale, what some of these muscles look like. Now you can imagine when you actually see it on a cadaver, you might not be able to see a lot of the stuff underneath. Why? Because you have these big flexor muscles that are sitting there and you have to actually like peel them away to see a lot of the other stuff, which is kind of gross, but kind of cool at the same time. So here's kind of what it looks like. We can see that most of them are originating at that medial epicondyle, and we can see their line of pull based on where they insert. Pretty neat. All right, let's go on to the next one. So here we have our lateral epicondylar group. We have a number of muscles again, and we can see the first four all originate at the lateral epicondyle, and they generally have very common actions. So if we go through, we see the extensor carpi ulnaris, wrist extension, ulnar deviation. So extensor, you should think extension, ulnaris, ulna, ulnar deviation, right? So these names are actually useful. They kind of help give it away. Extensor digitorum, so you see here extensor, digit, so you should think extend the digit, right? So that's gonna be involved in wrist and finger extension. So wrist, finger, extension. Extensor digiti minimi, so extensor digit, right? Extension of the wrist and pinky finger. So this is going to be something that specifically extends the pinky finger. Extensor carpi radialis brevis, wrist extension and radial deviation. And then again, we have a couple more here. We got another plus one, another plus one. These do not originate at the lateral epicondyle, but have such similar actions and similar line of pull, they usually get clumped into this group as well. So we see extensor carpi radialis longus, which is involved in wrist extension and radial deviation, and extensor indice, which is the extension of the index finger and a little bit of the wrist as well. So these can be kind of lengthy and within the names and sometimes confusing, but most of the names help kind of give away what they actually do, right? So if it's a flexor, it usually does finger and or wrist flexion. If it's an extensor, it does wrist and or finger extension. If it says radialis, it usually moves towards radial deviation. If it says ulnaris, it usually moves to ulnar deviation, right? Something along those lines. So here's another group, an image of it. So on the left, we see kind of like what it would look like from the top, like a very superficial image. And then on the right, we actually have a much deeper image if we peeled a lot of that muscle away so we could see some of the deeper uh, muscles of the forearm. And we can actually see some of the other ones that we talked about like supinator uh, and brachial radialis from that previous discussion. Okay, so those are kind of the big ones. Now, just keep in mind, that's not an all-inclusive list. Any of you who have studied anatomy and physiology before would know that, yeah, there's a lot more to it than just that. But that's kind of the meat and potatoes that we want you to be aware of going forward so we can talk about movement more effectively. There are certainly more things we can discuss, but this is kind of like the nuts and bolts that we want to hit on. So now, if we're looking at the elbow, wrist, and hand, and we're trying to describe movement, we generally don't describe the finite kind of given movements of things like gripping onto something or holding onto something. So usually when we're describing sport or exercise movements, we kind of assume 
things like finger and or wrist flexion if we're gripping onto something. So usually when we're actually describing sporting or exercise movements, we're really talking kind of primarily about the elbow. That's usually the landmark of choice that we're looking at. There are some specific examples of exercises and sporting movements where we're actually doing very direct either wrist extension or flexion or finger extension or flexion. But for kind of our gross movements like throwing a ball or hitting a, something with a tennis racket, right, we kind of assume some of those finite movements are already going on and we don't necessarily need to describe that. It's kind of a predetermined assumption, right? Now again, we can do that, but for the most part we won't. So let's take a look at some examples. So here we have overhead tricep extension, sometimes called freedom press. If you get this wrong, you are in bad shape, really, really bad shape. Why? Hmm. Well, because the name gives a lot of things away. Okay, so what are the correct movement terms? First off, tricep extension, right? So we're gonna see elbow extension overhead, right? So we're going from a flexed position to an extended position against resistance, right? So in this case, we started flexed, we're moving towards extended. What are the agonist muscles involved? The triceps, right? So the name of the exercise gave it all away. Don't get it wrong, right? Overhead tricep extension, primary muscle, tricep, primary movement, extension of the elbow, right? So. If we want to be really specific now, how would we actually accurately describe the downward phase of the movement? Think about it. So what are we doing when we're going from the weight above our head to the weight behind the head? Well, we're actively or passively doing elbow flexion, right? So we're actually flexing at the elbow, we're decreasing the joint angle. Does that mean that we are actively engaging our elbow flexors to lower the movement? No, they do provide a role in stabilizing the movement, but here we're actually seeing an eccentric muscle action of the triceps on the downward movement. This is something that a lot of people tend to get wrong. So although the elbow is flexing, the primary agonist muscles are going to be the triceps, both on the upward and downward phase. Make sense? All right, let's look at another one. Twist curl. Another example that I like. So in this case, we're starting with our wrists probably in a somewhat of a neutral position, and then we're gonna curl up and turn up to palms up, right? So what are the correct movement terms here in our twist curl example? Well, we have some elbow flexion. So in this case, instead of going from flexed to extended, we're actually starting extended and moving to flexed, right? So that's elbow flexion. And in this case, we're actually turning our palms up as we go. So that's gonna be supination. Right, so hopefully nothing too crazy there. So what are the muscle groups involved in that movement? Well, we're gonna see our biceps brachii, our brachialis, brachioradialis, and supinator, right? All the muscles that are involved in elbow flexion and or supination. Make sense so far? Nothing too crazy there, right? All right, another one, wrist curls. So in this case, we're holding a barbell or a dumbbell or some type of implement, and we're trying to pull it up and really work on those forearm muscles, right? So what's the correct movement term? Well, we're actually trying to pull our palms up towards our, the anterior portion of our forearms. So that'll be a wrist flexion exercise. What are the agonist muscles? Essentially pick any from that medial epicondylar group, right? So we know there's a whole bunch we can choose from. Any of the ones on that list that do wrist flexion are gonna be primarily involved, right? So no brainer there, anything for wrist flexion, boom. That's gonna be some of our primary muscles. Let's take a look at a goofy example. One of my favorite sporting moves ever, the Shoryuken, popularized from Street Fighter, right? So what are we actually seeing in this one? Well, if we look at the picture, we have Ken here, he's on fire, and his elbow is starting in a flex position, and he's actually moving all the way up into the Shoryuken, right? So what are the correct movement terms when we're looking at the elbow and wrist? Well, what we're seeing is we're going from a flexed position to an extended position, right? So that's going to be elbow extension. And then it looks like he's cocking his fist a little bit and that might just be for dramatic effect in the picture. So it looks like he's doing some finger flexion and maybe a little bit of a wrist flexion to actually cock his hand. So we're gonna see elbow extension and then a little bit of finger and wrist flexion possibly. So what are the agonist muscles involved? probably our triceps brachii for sure to do that elbow extension. And then any of our wrist and finger flexors, maybe even the supinator, depending on how he started his position. It looks like he's starting here and then kind of turning up. So he's doing a little bit of a supination, maybe. Who knows, something along those lines. But if we were to look at the elbow and wrist, that's primarily what's going on. Make sense? All right, guys, 
So I hope we have a pretty good idea of how it describes some of our upper extremity movements so far. We're gonna keep breaking down all of our different major muscle regions and different joints and keep learning how to describe this movement appropriately. All right, RP Plus, RPU, I'm out. I will see you next time.